If ranting about Trump pushes readers away, then they weren't the right readers for me in the first place. Meet Palais Beau, a digital nomad from Denmark on an epic journey around the world. Time for another chat with uh, another blogger, but not just any blogger. I'm here with adventurous Kate, Kate McCauley, and uh, you are, if not the, then one of the absolute biggest bloggers in the world. Am I right to say that? Well, you know, I kind of feel like an asshole if I end up saying, "Sure, I'm one of the biggest in the world," but you know, I've, I've, you know, I've been up there the past couple years. I suppose you could say that. This is adventurous Kate. Kate McCauley. She travels the world for a living. And it can be hard to be modest because as a travel blogger, she's a superstar. One of the first and one of the most successful. At the age of 26, she quit her job to travel the world alone. She spent six months in Southeast Asia and she turned her travel blog into a full-time business. Nine years later, she's based in New York, but still traveling 77 countries and seven continents. This is her story. This is the Radio Vagabond podcast. This is also a bonus episode and not a part of my regular travel podcast. Like the last three Friday episodes, it's recorded in Antigua and made possible by the Antigua and Barbuda Tourism Authority and Elite Island Resorts, and produced by radioguru.co.uk. I asked Kate how it all began. Well, you know, that's really funny because I've been blogging for a very long time, since um, long before I became a travel blogger. I started blogging when I was 18 years old in 2002, a freshman in college, and I loved it. I blogged almost every day, and I remember near the end of college, I said to myself, if I could have any dream job, it'd be getting paid to blog about my life. And that was such a joke because back then there was nothing like that. But over the years, I decided I want to get more serious about my true love, travel. So I started Adventurous Kate, which was already my screen name on everything. So I figured I might as well own the dot com. And I began blogging about my past trips. And at the time, I was working a job that I didn't enjoy. So I decided I worked in search engine marketing. But, and while it did start kind of better, like doing some interesting SEO copywriting in the travel industry, it ended up being just paid search for all these brands. So it would, you know those little ads on the side of Google? Mm -hmm. That's paid search. It's incredibly boring work. And I would always be writing copy that said, want your teeth not to fall out of your face? Use this denture cream. (laughs) So it was, it was pretty boring. So I decided to save up my money and travel Southeast Asia for seven months. And that honestly kicked off everything. And while I subsisted on my savings for a long time, that was in October, 2010, by the way, when I first started traveling. And the blog really took off while I was away and after I got home from that first trip I said to myself you know I think if I work a little harder I could actually make this work and I haven't gone back to work since what are the income streams uh, from a blog like yours is it uh, is it writing for destinations and and brands in the industry or is it um, uh, media vine or tell us uh, a little bit about where the money comes from well it's changed a lot over the years back when i started pretty much the only way to make money on a travel blog was to sell text links and a lot of us did that but you know that's a much more taboo practice these days Um, today what i do mostly if you are still if you're trying to make your blog work for you full time you have to have at least some of the streams be passive or else you're going to run yourself ragged. And for me, a lot of my passive streams include affiliate marketing, when you link to items and if people buy them, you get a small cut, or display marketing, which is like Mediavine is what I use, Um, display ads throughout your site. That and the more active work that I do is campaigns for other brands and other kinds of advertising that I create and write myself, some social media work. Yeah, there's quite a lot going on. Speaking on how a content creator makes money, Here's how I make a little bit from this podcast. As a regular listener, you would know that I mention a website called Hotels25.com from time to time. It's a great tool to help you save time and money whenever you need a hotel room. It searches a lot of the biggest hotel search sites in one simple search and finds where you get the best price on the exact same room. And if you book a room through Hotels25.com, I get a small cut of what you pay. It's important that you know that you don't pay extra. You save money. And at the same time, you support the work I do producing this podcast. 
if you want, you can use Hotels 25 for that reason. But I highly recommend that you use it to get the best rates. Okay, back to Kate. After those seven months, she didn't start traveling full time. Well, uh, there was a bit of a complication. I ended up meeting a boy in Vietnam. And so I went back to the UK where he lived for the final month of that. And then when I, I went home to see my family in Massachusetts where I grew up. And I, so I spent the summer at home and then I heard about a travel blogging conference in Innsbruck in August. And a lot of my travel blogger friends were going, so I was like, you know what, why don't I try to go to that? So I went back to England to see my boyfriend at the time and went to Innsbruck. Went, it was Austria for the first time. I went to Germany for the first time. I even went to Liechtenstein. And I got them to host me, which is really I was, nice. I was in Liechtenstein just a few months ago, and that was my last country in main, mainland Europe that Your I needed to go to. Yeah. I, I hit my last country in Europe last year. I went to Cyprus. That was my final country. Yeah, well, I, I don't have Iceland and I don't have Cyprus. So I, I, in mainland Europe, I have them all, but I, I still need those two islands. Oh, that's so awesome. Uh, and Liechtenstein. I think Liechtenstein is my favorite of the microstates. So beautiful. so beautiful. The mountains everywhere. Really nice. Oh, and that really weird art museum, it kind of gave me nightmares. But then it's all good. You can go to the vineyards, the prince's vineyards, and drink his wine. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and he walks around in the street, and uh, it's, it's, it's very safe and beautiful. Yeah. yeah, so, and you can walk the country from end to end. It's yeah. tiny. Yeah. No, I interrupted you. Then you went to Innsbruck. I went to Innsbruck. I went to Liechtenstein. I went to Germany, and I ended up crashing at my then boyfriend's place for quite a while, and basing myself in Europe, which I didn't realize at the time. But in 2011, 2012, that was extremely strategic, because that was where all the work was happening for travel bloggers at the time. Europe was far ahead of the rest of the world. If you wanted to do work in the travel blogging industry, it, you pretty much had to be in Europe. You're listening to the Radio Vagabond podcast. Before we continue, I'd like to remind you that I would be so thrilled if you shared it on Facebook or Twitter. And now, back to the show. So I spent a lot of time in Europe, and you know, what I do mainly is solo travel. So I did a lot of travel on my own, I, I and there were some side trips off that. I got an insane trip offer to Jordan. That was 2011. You know, back in 2011, the Jordan Tourism Board was giving out these crazy trips. They were trying to promote like crazy because of the Arab Spring, because most visitors to Jordan um, did it in tandem with Egypt. And now that people weren't going to Egypt, they weren't getting visitors. So they were really trying to turn Jordan into a destination of its own, which it really is. Jordan is fantastic on its own. And to get to do an incredible trip like that blew me away. Luxurious. I had my own guide. I got to explore it. It was really wonderful. My travels have really taken me all over the world. I've been to seven, I've been to seven continents, and we are here right now in Antigua, which is my 79th country. I think it'd be nice to hit 100 before I turn 40. I'm 34 right now, so I, th I think that's a doable goal. Hey, I'm at 83. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta catch up to you. <laughs> but I don't have so much time on the planet that you have, so uh, so I, I need I need to hurry up because uh, I'm I'm trying to do them all as well. But uh, You're try are you trying to do every country? Yeah. Now you see that has never been a goal of mine. It is for a lot of people, and I totally get it. But I don't want to be like, all right, I have I have all this time. I got to do a trip, but I really have to go to Chad. Yeah. And when I just want to go back to Italy and eat some pasta. That's, seriously, that's, that's not the way I do it. I do go back to a lot of countries I've been to before. I've done a, a lot of traveling in the U.S. as well, and I've been there, so I didn't really technically need to go there in, in that goal. No, for, for me, it's, it's something uh, that I strive for, but I'm not one of those that go uh, just chasing countries and, and ticking it off a list. Uh, I, I, I like to keep track of how far I am and so do you, apparently, uh, because you yeah. knew that it was 17 high. Yeah, uh, I, I do like the whole numbers thing, the organization thing, mm. yeah. And I'm uh, getting in, in Europe, you know, like I said, I don't have a goal to visit every country, but I did want to visit every country in Europe yeah. because I love Europe so much. And I did finally achieve that last year when I went to Cyprus. Mm. And I do want to visit every U.S. state as well. And I've, I've done 29 uh, in the last uh, yeah. few years. So, so yeah, I'm, I, it's, it's very diverse. It's, mm -hmm. That's uh, the Europe for Eu a European. Yeah. <laughs> Kate is now based in New York. And like I said, she's not traveling full time. But she did at some point. More or less, I traveled full-time for about five years. Yeah. And now I've been living in New York for three years. 
I have my own apartment. I live in Harlem, and it means a lot to me that I can actually have my own place. That's really important to me, especially being an introvert, just having my own space. That's all for me is really important. And these days, I travel about 25% of the time. For me, that seems like a really good balance, at least at this moment in time. And of course, if it turns out not to be a, as good a balance, I'll shift it. However, yeah, but your job is still adventurous, Kate. So uh, what do you do the 75% of the time? Well, here's the thing. A lot of people think that I'm actively blogging while I'm on trips, but I don't do that anymore. When I'm traveling, I like to see as much as possible. I like to spend my time exploring. I no longer want to be holed up in my room trying to find the corner where the Wi-Fi works and just trying to crank out content ahead of time. You know, that doesn't really serve anybody. I, I much prefer having the extra time while I'm at home, and that's when I do all the actual writing and the photo editing and all the important stuff. Yeah. Actually, when I was uh, a week into my my journey uh, in in July 2016, I, I started in early July. I went to uh, a travel conference in Stockholm, and I spoke to uh, uh, another uh, great travel blogger, Nomadic Matt, uh, who you told me was grew up in the uh, very close yeah. to where you grew up. Yeah, Boston area. Both yeah, of us yeah. who grew up very close. And he, he gave me this advice because I told him what my plan was. By then, I had a very specific plan on where I was going to be and what time. He said, you need to slow down because you're, you didn't go all the way to India to sit behind the computer all the time. You need to uh, slow down so you ha still have time to do the editing on the podcast and do your, your content uh, and, and, and do your work because I have to work as well. I have a, a production company where I produce uh, sound design. So he said, really slow down. And, and I am a full-time traveler, but I sometimes I go fast and sometimes I stay in the same place for a longer time. Yeah, that makes so much sense because you can't do two things to complete excellence all the time. You can't be an outstanding worker and an outstanding traveler at the same time. And not a lot of people realize that. Which is why I think a lot of people who decide to take the leap and and work online or or take their or start a small business or something like that and do it while traveling, why so many of them crash and burn or get stressed up and inevitably end up living in Chiang Mai. <laughs> It's a cliche for a reason, but I mean, but you know, being able to live in Chiang Mai or another expat hangout like Merida, Mexico is really popular right now. Berlin's great in Europe. Estonia is going to have a digital nomad visa soon, which is really interesting. But just being able to sit down and crank out your work is so important. I can take anything you can throw at me and nothing can get me down Life is looking so bright, the sun is up again, I'm feeling like I could fly No clouds in my way Before we continue, I just want to say a deep, heartfelt thank you to the people who wrote a review in iTunes or your podcast app. This means so much to me. Thank you. Lift it up on your shoulders, I can see the whole world. There's nothing that I cannot do, no. You and me together, we got this thing down. And nothing we cannot do. No clouds in our way, no Do you feel that the uh, the industry is very much different these days than it was when you really got into it in, in, in 2010? Would, would you be able to do exactly the same and still achieve the same success, you think? Absolutely not. I couldn't jump in the same way that I did back then and do today because the industry has changed so much. As I always say, the money has never been better and the content has never been worse. It seems like everyone is trying to out-boring each other. And that drives me crazy. You know, back when I started in 2010, I read these travel blogs because I love the stories. 
And because I, you know, the, the nosy side of me love peeking in on other people's lives. But you don't see a lot of narrative travel writing anymore. Everything is totally overdone for SEO. Especially, you know, there are certain sites who will have titles for blog posts like, give me a country so you know I'm not making fun of someone in particular. Albania. Okay, you'll see a blog post title like, best Albanian food and Albania things to do here and plus free Albania travel map. And that'll be like the title of the blog post. You know, whenever I see these, I always screenshot them and I send them to my friend Kaylin and I go, your SEO sucks. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was exactly my question. Do you think it is because it really has, the SEO part has become so important so people get sidetracked and, and don't focus enough on the on the great stories? I think that is absolutely a factor. I, somebody once... In one of the travel blogging groups, she said something like she wanted to write a year, a recap of her year or something like that, but she couldn't find out which keywords to rank on. And everyone was like, oh, you could rank for this or you could rank for that. And I was like, people, what are you doing? No one is going to be Googling something that ends up with some rando's yearly recap. That's something that you either write for yourself or you write for your readers. You write to entertain them. That's the kind of stuff they're looking for. And not everything has to be an SEO powerhouse. And at the same time, at the same time, not every blog post needs to be a moneymaker. And I think so many people forget that. But I take it that you are still very much into the SEO, that you 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 know your thing about how to make it uh, SEO friendly? Yes. One of the big breaks in my life was that I initially got that job working in search engine marketing. And you know why I got that? Because of my blog. Oh. This was back in Boston. I had been out of college for two years, and I had been working at a place that called itself a marketing firm, but it was really a call center. I didn't like the job. I was ready to get out. and But I was still blogging like crazy on my personal blog in my private time, and there were a lot of women around Boston who wrote their own blogs, and we kind of became friends, commented on each other's stuff like that. And one was a woman who was a few years older than me who ran a blog called The Misses, and she emailed me one day. She goes, hey, Kate, I need an assistant. I work in search engine marketing. And I'd like to know if you'd be interested in coming in because anyone can learn SEO, but not anyone can learn how to write. And I already know you can write. And I was like, yes, yes, God, yes, please get me out of this fake marketing firm. <laughs> so, um, and I got hired and that really made such a big difference for me in the long term because just like that, I knew how to write for SEO. And not only that, for, S for travel SEO, because that job was at a travel booking site. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. Your blog is... Um is very outspoken. It's uh, if you're also kind of political here and there, and it's it's very personal. Can can you tell me a little bit more about why you chose to do it like that? Well, that's a really interesting question. What is it that makes me decide to be so outspoken? I guess my entire life, I haven't been afraid of what people say about me. I've always been unabashedly myself. I've always been very opinionated, and also I occupy a position of very high privilege. So I believe it's my duty to shine the light on people who don't have the opportunities that I have. Um, the reason why I'm a liberal, the reason why I'm a Democrat, is because I care about people who are not myself. You know, it's hard to believe, but that's the truth. Some people do. Yeah, yeah but I, I do love writing about this. And I think something interesting to point out is that Rick Steves is a major figure who is also very political. He speaks out a lot on marijuana legalization. That's his big cause and various other social issues. But marijuana is the big one. And every time he speaks out about social issues, he's got a lot of people who are his customers who are saying like, oh, Rick, I wish you wouldn't get political. But you know what? Rick Steves does great. Mm -hmm. It's helping him just fine. Yeah. And I think that when you're in a public position, the way that I am, and you never speak up about these issues because you, quote unquote, don't want to be political, you're basically telling the world that you don't give a shit about people who aren't as fortunate as you. Is it a decision? I know for a fact that the, especially the U.S. Is, is very divided into blue and red. And uh, have you thought about you might push some of your readers away or are you fine with that? If ranting about Trump pushes readers away, then they weren't the right readers for me in the first place. It also, it's also worth pointing out that the vast majority of people who travel internationally are liberal. Not all of them, the vast majority. So, you know, I'm already playing to a, a very existent audience. Yeah, yeah I, I, I traveled the world and I spoke to a lot of Americans, uh, but uh, it took me a long time. I was actually in the U.S. until I found someone who admitted he voted for Trump because I 
I'd never met them around the world. Yeah, I mean, There's education is a huge reason for that. Mm -hmm. Education is a huge re reason why people are voting for Republicans. They're convincing them that they're voting in their best interest, when in reality, um, the 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 people who are uneducated are the ones who are getting hurt the most by Republican policies. And, um, of course, at the same time, people who tend to be less educated are not the, the type of people who tend to travel widely. So, She calls herself Adventurous Kate for a reason. On her blog, she shares stories of the time she was an extra in a really, really bad German movie, when she got naked in public and took a boob to the face in Istanbul, when she hit on Jon Stewart in New York, which subsequently got her mocked on The Daily Show. And when we come back, Kate will talk about the time she was shipwrecked in Indonesia. And then one of our crew members came in and said, everybody put your life jackets on. And that, of course, was one of the worst moments of my life. And I was so panicked, but at the same time thinking, you gotta be kidding me, are you serious? We, we gotta put on our, our life jackets. Produced by radioguru.co.uk, my production company. This is the Radio Vagabond, and my name is Palabo. Stay with us. I share a lot about what I do in this podcast, and now I'd like to hear from you. Where are you and what are you doing right now when you're listening to this episode? One of the emails I already got was from Oscar. He writes, Hi, Pella. When I listened to your podcast number 124, I was working out with my weights in my backyard in the afternoon sun. Normally, I listen to your podcast when I'm working out to be entertained when I'm sweating. When I'm listening, I always get fascinated and reminded how big and exciting the world is. You made me realize that you should take action and control of your own life if you want to have amazing experiences. Even if it takes that you sacrifice some comfort and step out into the unknown. You're doing a phenomenal job with the podcast and the quality is impressive. Thank you for all the time you spent producing them. Oscar. Thank you so much for the kind words, Oscar. It's an email like this that keeps me going and I'm so glad that you feel inspired. Thank you. If you also want to drop me a line and tell me where you are and what you're doing right now when you're listening to these words, please use this special email address for this, listener at theradiovagabond.com. You can also send me a voice message on WhatsApp. The number is plus 45 40 105 105. Now, back to the show. In one of the previous episodes, I spoke to um, traveling Tom, Tom, uh, Tom from uh, the Netherlands, and uh, we were talking about nothing bad ever happened to us. Uh, we never, uh, we've, we've never been robbed. We've never been, uh, and then I said, we've never been in a shipwreck uh, because you told me that you had. Yeah, that's kind and of... we're kind of jealous of you, Kate. You don't want to be jealous of me. That night sucked. <laughs> no, the shipwreck is one of the things that I really became known for. And to be honest, that's one thing that kind of pushed my blog into the stratosphere. This happened See, that's why I want to be in a shipwreck. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> the publicity. Um, yeah, this happened in 2011. I was in Indonesia, and I wanted to do this this boat tour from Lombok to Komodo Island and back. And it's like a five-day backpacker cruise. And I actually wrote to them and asked them if they would sponsor me in exchange for coverage. And they said, yeah, sure. So I said, great, let's do it. First, And this was the tail end of rainy season in this part of Indonesia. And honestly, they should not have been going out, not in this kind of weather. And it was very rainy on the second night. It was... I had fallen asleep really early because it was really choppy and I had taken a motion sickness pill, which put me to sleep. And then all of a sudden, this happened at around 2 a.m., I, I felt like a jerk and I was sleeping on the bench next to a window and the shade came up and drenched me in rain. And so I scampered down to the bottom because everybody was sleeping on the ground because it was a backpacker cruise. And then one of our crew members came in and said, everybody put your life jackets on. And that, of course, was one of the worst moments of my life. And I was so panicked, but at the same time thinking, you got to be kidding me. Are you serious? we we got to put on our, our life jackets. And then, so the boat, they began gunning the boat to shore. 
And at that point, um, it was starting to sink. We could feel it lilting to the right a little bit. Starboard and port, I always forget all the names, but yeah, lilting to the right. Um, and, and then eventually they told us the lifeboats cannot be used. And there were two lifeboats on board. One was inflated and one was wood. And they told us neither of them could be used. So it turns out we would have to jump off and swim to shore, about 60 meters. And so that's what we had to do jumped off the edge of the boat um you know the boat was like falling to the right so we stood on the left side and jumped in what was going through your mind at that time um you know there were so many crazy emotions going through my mind i was crying i was freaking out i was praying but at the same time part of me really focused really well and knew what i had to do and it's like when when things got really scary i just knew exactly what to do and So I stood on the boat and just jumped in. And I remember jumping in and thinking, wow, the water's really warm as we jumped in. And then we pretty much had to get to shore. But this was not a beach. Do not think that we washed up on a beautiful beach. It wasn't like that. This was a volcanic island. It was all black volcanic rock. It was really sharp. I I lucked out in two major ways. Well, you know, because we couldn't use the life jackets, we had to leave all our belongings on board. So I couldn't take my day pack with all my stuff. But luckily, I was sleeping next to my dry bag. And in my dry bag, I had my phone, my camera, and my debit card, which are pretty much the three most important things. So I, had, so I jumped off with those. And I also happened to be wearing sports sandals that, um, that wrapped around my feet, so my shoes stayed on me, which was really good because a lot of people with flip-flops were climbing the rocks, and they really cut up their feet. Also, we had a 10-month-old baby on board. No. Seriously. Yeah, um, her parents, she was Danish, her parents were Danish, a little girl named Elin, and her parents were the same age as me. I was 26 at the time, I remember that, and the father, and of course, this was an Indonesian backpacker boat, they didn't have a child's life vest, so her father took a scarf, he tied it around his wrist, and tied it around her middle, and he jumped in, holding her straight up in his arms. Can you believe that? And just watching that I was like he's the same age as me imagine having to do this with your child oh my god I'm just uh, picturing them going on this rocky uh, shore with a with a baby yeah wow yeah it's just it was just so insane and you know once we did get on the once we did get on the shore I was calling out for the solo travelers because I realized you know we're all here solo because um, no one's going to be looking for us so I made sure that all of us had made it and we all had and then there was a German dive boat that was nearby. They heard our distress signal, and they sent a dinghy over to pick us up. We had to spend like half an hour climbing to another side of the island, but they sent their boat over, and they picked us up. We went on the boat, and it was immediately clear that this boat was a lot nicer than ours. Um, one guy gave up his room to the family, and oh, the, the poor baby, we had to wrap towels on her for diapers because that was all there was. And we spent the night there. I went into the linen closet and fell asleep on a, on a pile of blankets. And the next day, Indonesia sent their equivalent of the Coast Guard to pick us up and take us to Labuan Bajo on the island of Flores. Uh-huh. Yeah, and the island that we landed on was a little island off Komodo. Yeah. So technically, we could have been landing on an island filled with man-eating dragons after swimming through an ocean full of sharks. Yeah. So yeah, fun times right there. I don't know how jealous I am right now, but uh, <laughs> wow, wow. What, what happened to uh, all the stuff that was left? Did the boat sink completely? Oh, that's not all. The crew robbed us. You are no, no, no. And you know what? I get it. Because they were about to lose the best job they ever had. It's so no wonder they robbed us. I, I was pissed, but I understand it. They brought back our belongings, and our bags were all empty, and instead of electronics were filled with cans of beer and Ritz cracker tubes. Yeah. But amazingly, my passport was recovered. It had been in in the salt water for a long time. So for the next, like, I just replaced my passport. So it has been um, eight years um, since the shipwreck. And every time I would go through immigration, well, you know, the Brits would always say, did you drop it in the wash? And the Americans would always say, did you take a bath with it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so yeah, my, my gross passport has, is now gone. <laughs> but yeah, so they robbed us and, you know, 
we were pissed off. Everyone got a refund, and I was wondering myself, hey, I'm here for free. Am I going to get a refund? And they went through the list of names, and they were like, Kate, compliment for you to get a refund. But later, one of the people in my group was like, Kate, there is an envelope at the, comp- at the company's office with your name on it. So I went and picked it up, and the money was inside. So I actually made money on the trip, which is nice. Yeah. I had to spend 100 bucks on a flight back to Bali because there was no way I was going overland after that. That was almost it for this episode. In a minute, Kate will share some big news about a project she's about to start. But first, let me remind you that this episode is supported in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best prices on hotel rooms, guest houses and hostels around the world. Hotels25.com You can find the Radio Vagabond on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts for Android phones, Stitcher, SoundCloud, TuneIn, your smart speaker, the Radio Vagabond on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook, or on the radiovagabond.com. In short, anywhere. I wouldn't be surprised if you could pick it up on your toaster soon. Before we wrap it up, uh, uh, what's what's in the future for you? Uh, continue doing what you're doing. Uh, any new projects that you uh, want to share with me? Yeah, there are a lot of new projects. There's one on the site and one not on the site. The one that's on the site is that I'm currently creating solo female travel destination guides to destinations all over the world. I have about 15 now. I've hired writers to take some destinations I don't know well, like India and Brazil. But these guides are the absolute best guides for solo female travel. They will tell you in Paris that you need to say bonjour madame or bonjour monsieur every time you enter a place or else they will treat you rudely. It um, it talks about in Central America how the street harassment in Belize is so different from the street harassment of Nicaragua. So I want these guides to be the absolute most helpful documents to help women travel the world safely. And they're written by the absolute experts who know the stuff that all the other guides mix. And the other one is, surprise, surprise, is a podcast coming oh, out soon. Yeah. Um, podcast. I, I sort of knew that, but I didn't. Well, I didn't know if it was too early to yeah. share it. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're doing some work on it right now. It's going to be called Adventurous Kate Goes There. It's a double entendre because Adventurous Kate goes there. She travels, and Adventurous Kate goes there. She goes for the controversial topics. So it's about travel and feminism, and we will see how it goes. Adventurous Kate, thank you so much. Thank you. Happy to be here. When this episode comes out, both Kate and I are in Trento in Italy for the Traverse 19 conference that I spoke to Paul Dow and Michael Ball about last week. And we're both speaking Sunday morning. Kate will share what she's learned in nine years as a professional travel blogger. And I will talk about how to do a travel podcast in my session, Travel Podcast Like a Pro. And I'm so looking forward to that. My name is Palabo. See you.